Kathy, let's talk for a minute about the, the Paiute culture. We were talking about the Anasazi uh, ability to make these really fine pots that we see up on top here. Their, their incredible, mysterious ability, I guess, since we, we, we've had trouble reconstructing them. But the Paiutes, in contrast, were known more for their basketry. Um, Paiutes, who came in after the Anasazi, and we think maybe about 1000 uh, AD, um, were again a nomadic tribe. They, uh, they followed the life ways of the people that were here before the Anasazi. Anasazi being sedentary and farming, uh, Paiutes were nomadic. They followed the, the crops from uh, place to place. Um, when you're traveling, it's, it's difficult to carry heavy objects and fragile objects. Um, so basketry became very important once again. Um, and the Paiutes are known for very fine basketry. And we find almost every size and shape um, imaginable that they were using for the various purposes. Is that one way that you can tell a, a sedentary culture then from a, from a nomadic one? Is, that, is basketry versus pottery? Is that? Uh, it's not real cut and dry because a lot of uh, farming groups also make baskets. Um, one differential may be that the Anasazi are so much older that a lot of their basketry hasn't survived and they maybe used it a lot more than we think they did. Um, we do know that the pottery of the Paiute seems to be rarer. It's of a different kind. Um, it's not as finely made. It's, it's a more coarser pottery, and um, we, we do find it in, in the Paiute sites quite often, but very rarely as whole vessels. And the, uh, the basketry is, um, has these really interesting designs. What, what uh, is, are they telling stories, or is it just is it a way of showing off your, your, their, their craftsmanship? Yeah, I, I'm not sure we know that for sure. Uh, and some of them have been identified as having particular meaning, and particularly what you're looking at in, in a lot of these cases is historic Paiute basketry, and it was made for a specific purpose of, uh, for sales. And so they were putting things into it that they thought people would um, like as a design. Uh, you find a lot of the geometrics that you find in, in pottery designs, but you find a lot of natural forms like butterflies and birds and, and uh, other things like that that they are putting in, and that, that probably had some meaning. Um, further north, they've, they've interpreted baskets much more than we have down here as to what the different elements mean. And are the southern Paiute baskets very similar to the northern Paiute baskets? To the northern Paiute, yes. Um, they, they use the same materials pretty much. Um, we, we have a willow base uh, for the most part, and then the designs are done with things like cat claw. North, they would be using other design um, material because maybe the desert plants don't grow up there, but um, they're, they're pretty similar to a northern Paiute. And then in terms of, of the footwear, I see that in, in your exhibit cases you also show slipper, well I don't know if they would call them sandals or slippers. Sandals, uh -huh. yeah. In this case uh, the sandals are made out of, of a leather type material. It uh, may be a mountain sheep and be prehistoric, or these may be a little more later and taken from a domestic um, animal. Um, the other little sandals are made out of yucca fibers and um, are, are certainly very similar to what Anasazi used for, for sandals. In the photograph that you have in the exhibit, it looks like they had the, the footwear is, is maybe a little fancier. Yeah, now that picture would have been taken, of course, after contact with uh, the, the white man and sometimes some information was brought in uh, from other groups and sometimes these pictures, the photographer actually brought the clothing and had the Native Americans dress in the clothing he brought. So sometimes we find Paiutes dressed up in Plains Indian buckskin uh, in some of the early pictures. So. Wow, well, that would really throw off a <laughs> It sometimes does, yeah. It's, uh... What else were the, uh, that do you have here that we should um, draw attention to in particular for the viewers? Um, certainly the, the, the water jugs um, that are coated with pine pitch to keep them so that the water would stay in them. Um, they have... Uh, so those are baskets that are actually baskets coated. Baskets coated with pine pitch to okay. make them waterproof, yeah. And does it work? Have you uh, we haven't put water in these because of their age, but uh, it, others have proven too. Okay, so a very different, different culture than yes. the Anasazi yes. from uh -huh. what we can tell. 
While archaeologists continue to study the rich material culture rescued from the rising waters of Lake Mead back in the 1930s, an ironic twist of fate is unfolding a few miles south of the museum. Well, Eva, we hear a lot about um, the drought in the Rockies and also the increasing population, certainly of Las Vegas and also Southern California. So that's, that's affecting the lake level. The lake level of Lake Mead has gone down something on, on the order of 60 vertical feet. Uh, and as a result, a lot of the archaeological sites that were excavated in the 30s were exposed. Um, there's not really a lot left to see. One interesting thing to see, though, is St. Thomas, the historic town. And uh, in the 30s, St. Thomas itself was inundated by Lake Mead. Um, some of the interesting historic photographs show show the waters lapping at the foundations of the home. And uh, some of that historic town is now visible also. So some of those foundations you can actually see from looking out there into the lake. That's right. There are, there are remains of his, historic occupation of the valley and prehistoric occupation of the valley. There must be a lot of excitement about that, that site. Um, it, there's a lot of interest both by some people that have old family connections to St. Thomas and uh, just people that are curious. There's a richness here of prehistoric culture that um, we're still discovering. We're still uncovering and uh, looking for more answers to the questions of how people lived a thousand years ago. The archaeological community of Nevada reminds the public it is against the law to remove historic and prehistoric artifacts from public lands. To effectively piece together the past, scientists and historians must study objects in the context in which they were originally found. They can then curate, interpret, and present their findings in museums created for the benefit of the public. The Lost City Museum is open seven days a week. For details, call 702. 397-2193 or visit nevadaculture.org on the web.